Hello and welcome. I'm Shane Hasty. I'm the lead editor for Culture and Methods on InfoQ.com, and I'm the host of the weekly Engineering Culture podcast. In this presentation, we're going to explore what it means to build and maintain a creative and collaborative engineering culture. And I'm drawing on the conversations, the podcasts, the articles, the news, the content from InfoQ.com over the last couple of years. So let's get straight into it. Building and maintaining a collaborative and creative engineering culture. A starting point for us at InfoQ is the annual trend report. Now we put this together once a year, at least, sometimes more frequently, and each of the domains on InfoQ explores what they are seeing. And this is done by talking to the editors and by looking at the content that we have and the content that is forthcoming. And we're looking for the topics that are over on the left of this graph that you see here, the uh, things that are of interest to the innovators and the early adopters. Because we believe by the time it moves across to the right, InfoQ will have a large body of content that people can then draw upon. So taking the perspective of information Robin Hoods going out there, finding what's happening, and then presenting it to the world through the, the InfoQ podcasts, newsletters, uh, website, and all of the other ways that we make this content available to you, the public. So when we looked at what was happening in 2021, well, we put this stuff, the stuff, the, some important topics over on the left. And some of these are the ones that I'm going to go a bit deeper into as we talk through. Things like team topologies, uh, the, the humanistic workplaces, good remote work. Now, I, I do want to point out we've distinguished there between good remote work and bad remote work. The... <laughs> Bad remote work, sadly, is something we see in all too many organizations, whereas there, there is some things that the, the better organizations, those who have a more effective culture, are getting right. Um, genuine diversity and inclusion rather than lip service. Things like team self-selection. The, the focus on professionalism and ethics. So there's a lot here. And I would um, also point you to every one of the slides, which you can download the, the, the content of, has the links to the articles on InfoQ for you to explore further. So let's get into it. Given that this is about culture, it's probably a good place to start is what is happening in culture? What is culture? That Johanna Rothman talks about culture as the lowest common denominator that the, of the behavior that is accepted in the workplace. And culture cascades down from the leadership, from the top. So it's what the executives and the leaders put up with. James and Suzanne Robertson have written a book. Uh, the book is called Happy to Work Here, and we have an article that explores some of the topics from that in there, and it talks to the, the killers, the improvers, and the drivers of culture. Uh, humans are still the most important components of culture. We've got technology, we've got all sorts of other things, and it's, it, culture is not this happy, clappy, feel-good thing. Culture directly impacts organizational performance both at the individual, the team, and the overall individual level. And in their article and in their work, James and Suzanne identified six drivers for workplace, workplace culture that can be identified and can then be deliberately worked with. These drivers are the perceived value of people, the perceived nature of time, safety and security, the concept of navigation by grown-ups, treat people like responsible adults, the bond of collective confidence, the believe and the perceived value of excellence, and then beneficence, the way that we treat each other in the workplace. 
So some, some useful pointers in there, things to consider, and what are the drivers, killers, improvers in your organizational culture that you can work with and work on to create this environment of psychological safety. Now, we have quite a lot of content on psychological safety. Um, going back to the, the, the original Google article or articles about the original Google research, the Project Aristotle work. But I found this image that really conveys some key factors that need to make, that, that need to be in place to enable psychological safety in the workplace. One, make it an explicit priority. This is not something that just happens. Uh, if you're a team lead, if you're a manager, if you're an executive, you have to call it out and you need to model it yourself. You need to create space to facilitate everyone in the team speaking out. We need to have our shared norms establish the, the ways that we approach, particularly failure. Failure should be a learning opportunity rather than a blame opportunity. This is incredibly important to, to this psychologically safe space. Create space for new ideas. And yes, embrace the wild ideas and embrace, and this is, this is hard, the productive conflict. We'll talk a bit later on about radical candor, but the, this ability to create a space where people can disagree respectfully. Now, psychological safety is certainly not new. It uh, was first spoken about in the literature in 1991. But what we have seen is a, is a lot more research of how important psychological safety is to team effectiveness and through that again to the, the organizational overall effectiveness. Another important topic that brings this humanistic aspects into play is mindfulness. The concept of being aware of yourself and being aware of the system that you are part of, this psychological complex system, and bringing that awareness to our interaction, our collaboration, our conversations with our teammates, with our stakeholders, with our colleagues in the greater organization. Another thing, and there's a, a podcast that we reference here, bringing the concept of playfulness into the workplace. Play is a great place to learn. Because when we are in this state of play, we're generally relaxed, open, and curious. And that enables, it opens up all the mental pathways. Uh, it, it builds on that safety. And it enables us to be truly creative. And in the knowledge worker economy of today, and of course, in the InfoQ audience target focus, uh, this human creativity is where the bulk of value comes from. And mindfulness is not just keeping calm. It's a habit of deep reflection. And one of the benefits of this, of building this habit, is it enables us to get into the, the state of flow more effectively. And this flow state uh, is so important for creative problem solving. Another important factor that we we see trending is mental wellness. And the image up on the screen here is, how are you really? Australia and New Zealand recently had a program, a, a piece of an initiative where people were looking at and asking that question of each other. How are you really? And making it again safe to have the conversation. 
the topics around mental illness are shrouded in taboo and it hinders and yet at any point in time one in five of us is going to be struggling with some sort of a mental health challenge we've seen studies through the the pandemic era that that's actually got as high as one in three because the the tension that we have been surrounded by through the the aftermath and 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 going through and continuing to go through the the lockdowns and the uh the uncertainty and the fear surrounding COVID-19 has been incredibly pressurizing now if we go back to the beginning of 2020 IT teams and enterprise software development groups and organizations, we stepped up. Within days, we shifted from fully in-person to fully remote for many organizations. We set up the infrastructure to support our colleagues in the, in the wider organizations. But that came with a tremendous amount of pressure and the, the, the burnout that is sitting there nascent in our systems today is something we need to be able to explore and to expose and to truly support each other as we build this focus on mental wellness. And part of being a safe space is embracing diversity and inclusion. We've had some thoughts, some a bias, I will say, that in software development, we've adopted agile methods as our approach to building software. And there's been a lot of benefit from that. We, we, we can see and there are very, very clear measurable outcomes that we can point to for organizations. But one of the underlying assumptions is, well, we're doing it, we're taking an agile approach. So of course, we're more inclusive, and we're more welcoming. Well, sadly, that's not really true. Um, there's this uh, a survey done by the Business Agility Institute. And there's a po I've got a podcast where episode where we explore it. 20 26% of resp respondents to that survey believe that agile approaches actively create exclusive exclusion and inequality in the ways of working. Think just about some of the mental perspectives, the introvert versus extrovert. For some of us, standing up at the daily stand-up and saying, what have I done? What will I do? What's in my way? Can be incredibly scary. So it's not just thinking about the, the big visible chunks of diversity and inclusion, although these are something we must tackle. Our industry has a terrible history of not embracing people of, of color, people who are different to the norm like me. And certainly our, uh, the imbalances, the gender imbalances are things that have to, have to, have to be addressed and addressed soon. If we think about just the, the, the simple difference in, in pay, In New Zealand, we've recently marked, I won't say celebrated, but we have marked the day. It was at the, in the middle of November, where basically women are working for the rest of the year for nothing because of the imbalance, the around about 9% salary difference, differential that exists across the, the economy as a whole these differentials still exist in information technology we have to fix these we have to become truly inclusive inviting and as the sign says there stand with you 
and make it safe for different to be not just accepted, but valued in our organizations. Because there is solid research that shows the more diversity there is on a team, the more creative problem solving that team is able to do. So let's bring in that diversity of the, the visible things, but also of the, the cognitive differences, the attitudinal differences, uh, touching back on the, on the mental health. How do we embrace people that are perhaps on the, the autism spectrum and make a safe space for all of us? And that safe space starts with how we bring people in to our organization. In my own experience, I have arrived for a new job, excited, interested, looking forward to working in this great environment, gone up to the receptionist. This was when we were working in person. And hi, I'm Shane. I'm here to meet with so-and-so and start my new job here. What's it like working here? Uh, Shane, hold on. Let me make some phone calls. Um, oh, so-and-so is not here yet. Uh, why don't you wait over there and let me find, try and find. And it took two hours to get into the building on my first day of work. Then it took a week to get a computer I could do work with. By that time, the excitement that I had felt at the beginning had turned into an unhealthy skepticism and I did not stay long at that organization. How do we change that onboarding process to one that is truly welcoming and bringing people into our new our organization with that excitement with that delight and make that beginning of their relationship really really strong and then building on that and building on that into the deeper employee experience and developer experience the developer experience is how do we remove the friction how do we make it simple and wherever friction exists, just automate it away or make it easy to point it out and change the process or change the system. Reduce that cognitive load so that these great engineers that we're employing are able to do great engineering and not spend their time fighting with the tools and the tooling and the system and the process that sits around them. And again, some great organizations are doing really interesting things about making uh, developer experience more and more effective. And we've got a number of talks and articles on InfoQ to explore that. One of the ways that we're seeing is through changing the way teams are formed. And this book by Sandy Mamoli and David Moll, Creating Great Teams, How Self-Selections lets, lets People Excel, talks about ways to mindfully, deliberately allow people to choose which team they want to work on and what work excites them. And by bringing them through this, the self-selection process and the article reference there is a case study of how Redgate software have done this. They have a deliberate reteaming process on a regular basis to, which allows the members of the team to strongly influence what the structures will be, but also what work they're going to work on. Obviously, there are, there are frames, there are guidelines, and there are criteria that leadership puts out, but the teams themselves choose who they're going to work with, what product they're going to work on, and what approach they're going to take. 
And this empowerment is part, one of the things that, again, builds this creative, collaborative, strong culture in the organization. You know, we trust people in their daily lives to make incredibly strong and important decisions like who they're going to marry, whether they're going to have children, whether they're going to buy a house. And th these are these decisions are, pre are pretty much always much, much bigger than anything that we get faced with at work. And yet at work, we often treat people largely like kindergarten students. Well, how do we lift that? And self-selection is one mode. This requires a very big shift in the way our leaders show up. And this concept of a leader as a coach, as a facilitator, um, leading with empathy rather than with command and control. Well, we, we've heard the term for years, servant leadership. One that I've heard recently that really resonates me is host leadership. If you think about the host at uh, an event at a party. It's a, we've invited people into our home. Well, the host is there. They're part of the group, but they're also facilitating and moving everything forward. How can I show up as a leader, as a host for the people that I am supporting, serving, bringing along on their journey? And this empathic approach. Empathy has been shown to be, uh, and in the article we say, the authors say, that empathy has emerged as a panacea to combat the anguish and suffering of the global pandemic and its impact on people and teams. Anyone in the organization can show up with that empathy. And if we've got all of these things, we're able to step into a space of what Kim Scott calls radical candor. This is the behavior that comes about when people care personally and are able to challenge directly in a relationship. It makes, it builds on that platform of psychological safety that we're, we're touching on all the way through here. And it enables us to have the hard conversations about how well are we really doing? What is happening in this? What did happen here? How do we make sure that if something went wrong, it doesn't go wrong again? What is broken in the system? What is missing in your knowledge? And it requires vulnerability on all of us. But again, just referring right back to the beginning, this culture cascades down. And the importance of demonstrating the behavior that you want to see in others when you are in that position of influence and power. We've got a whole lot in on InfoQ about different models and styles and approaches. I will do the, the, the personal place commercial here. The Hash No Projects book is a, an, a mini book that can be downloaded from InfoQ, where myself and Evan Laybourne talk about moving from project cultures to product and value stream-based cultures. We've got a lot of articles that talk about the different um, structures of organizations, bringing in sociocracy, holacracy, Jutta um, Eckstein and I've forgotten the other author's name, work on Bassanova, Beyond Budgeting, Open Space, Sociocracy and Agile together, combining all of those things. So there's a lot of content, a lot of information available for you to explore how to structure teams and organizations to become their most effective. 
And one of the things that I will certainly point to is the uh, work by Matthew Skelton and Manuel Piash. Manuel is one of the InfoQ author team, uh, editor team on team topologies, a wonderful book. And they, they offer a whole lot of supporting stuff around that. Organizing business and technology teams for fast flow. And the, the book provides a, a good model, a simple step-by-step -step, step guide for looking at organizational design for team interaction. Now, it's a simple model, but like with many simple things, it's really hard to get right. So start by thinking about what are the outcomes we want to achieve and then move forward to how do we need to structure the teams that we work in and with in order to achieve those outcomes. And we've got a, a focus on creating joyful workplaces. And this is a book by Richard Sheridan, the chief joy officer. His first book was Joy Incorporated. And we've got a series of articles where we've explored what happens at Menlo Innovations. The organization uh, founded by Richard Sheridan that is, and it was founded with a philosophy of how do we create a, an organizational culture of joy in work? This is the joy, the deep satisfaction of doing important things with people that I care about and that I like. Purpose-driven, truly empowerment, and a situation where the role of the leader is to make other people 10 times better, to really create that space for teams and individuals to become truly effective and to, to hold the space for joyous workplaces. A challenge for our, our industry is ethics. There's a lot of gaps, a lot of things not being done well in the ethical space today. As an industry, it's time we actually did step up. At InfoQ, we've been raising the topic of ethics for a while. You can see some of these articles go back to 2018, 2019. We, we, we're revisiting this. <clears throat> when we see things that are examples of unethical behavior, and also when we start to show up the, the good behaviors, um, how do we start to apply tech for good? And there's a lot of articles around that. The, most of us, most people in the software industry have not come across the professional, the codes of professional conduct that do exist for our industry. The Association of Computing, Computing Machinery, the ACM, has a code of ethics and professional conduct for people in our industry. How many of us have read it? How many of us have signed up to it? How many of us reference it when we are building our products? Do we pause and ask ourselves, how could this be misused? When I'm writing this block of code, what is the ethical implication of this code running in the wild? How do I, for instance, make the um, make it auditable, make it visible? So when we think of AI algorithms, there's been a lot of work uh, about transparency into those. Another aspect that we touch on here is climate change. As an industry, we have a bigger carbon footprint than aviation. What are we doing to reduce that carbon footprint? 
what can we do to shift for instance the where we're the, uh, the cloud service providers that we're using, are we putting pressure on them to use green energy? The, the big and fairly controversial one, the Bitcoin mining, how much power, what is the value that is this is adding to society? So there's a whole lot of things we need to hold up and ask ourselves, not can I do this, should I do this? And ethical behavior is hard, but we need to start being good global citizens. So that was the, the wrap up of some of the important topics that we feel do build towards a creative and collaborative engineering culture. I wanna leave you with this question. Where are you going next? What are you doing to transform yourself? If you want to achieve sustainable organizational and societal transformation, it starts with you. So I want you to mindfully reflect, where are you now? Where do you want to be in the future? Another resource that you can use is this Designing Your Culture uh, eMag that's available on InfoQ. Thank you very much. And please keep in touch.